about empowering women's voices by way of discussing women's her stories from the past. We have 13 impassioned essays, and we are fortunate enough to have nine of our writers here, three who have flown in from around the country to read to you today. The theosophist concept of malevolent thought forms is analogous with today's new age idea of bad energy i.e. any emotion that can be perceived as pessimistic or gloomy. Negativity appears to be synonymous with the Christian concept of the devil, and so it must be avoided at all costs. Sexuality is often viewed negatively and is therefore repressed. Once, at a metaphysical expo, a man approached me and demanded to know whether I was an unspoiled column of pure light. <laughs> I replied that I was not. <laughs> he said, no. And he reacted with disgust. Shaking his head, he scuttled away. <laughs> And Lakota, we introduce ourselves by placing ourselves where we're at. And so what I just said to you essentially is, what's up? But a lot more kindly, I guess. I am from Shine River, as Karen was saying. That's in central South Dakota. If any of you were paying attention during the No Dapple protests, that tribe is just south of Standing Rock. So we're sister tribes, part of the Ocheti Shakoi, which I talk about in my essay. My breath whooshed out of my lungs as the first wave of sizzling steam hit my face like a slap. Someone started hitting a hand drum, and the first round of Inipi began with a rousing prayer song to Wakan Kanka, the great spirit. Though I sat motionless, my blood raced, with 60 fired stones emitting a liquid blaze with every drop of water thrown on them, sweat poured from my skin in a full body cry. After what seemed like hours had passed, the song ended, and the leader opened the door flap to allow in a blast of winter night air. A few people left, too overwhelmed or physically unable to continue with an EP, of which there were three more rounds. I thought about leaving as well, but at the time I self-medicated through cutting, and the intense heat from the stones felt a lot like the pain I often craved. It was definitely the wrong mindset to be in for ceremony, but there it is. <laughs> I'm thankful I stayed, though, because as soon as the flap closed and we were again plunged into darkness, the spiritual leader spoke, and he told us about Pate Shawi, her power, and her gifts to the Lakota people, of which we now were taking part. What immediately struck me about this woman was that she didn't take any shit from men. A beautiful woman, Pate Shawi, obliterated the first asshole who had impure thoughts about her and body, leaving only his skeleton and a promise for other would-be rapists. As someone whose body had been appropriated by others, and who had often heard and saw the bodies of other Native girls being taken advantage of, it was empowering for me to listen to a story about a strong Lakota woman who was looked upon and not simply remembered but acknowledged as a living deity. One day, I spied something red and white and pink on the side of the heap outside the church of St. Thomas Aquinas. It was a doll with eyes that shut halfway when you laid her down, dark curly hair and red lips. I knew in my heart that I'd scored and walked all the way home alone with her tucked under my arm. My mom wanted me to clean her, but I liked the way she was seeped in the interesting scent of disregard. What else has history tossed away? Back in the 1680s, in France, Julie Davigny was a restless adolescent. She grew tired of Darmagnac and took up with a fencing master and outlaw named Seron. They traveled around Marseille, performing at fairs and taverns. She began singing with the Opera de Marseille and discovered she had an uncanny talent for it, which along with her good looks, intelligence, and charisma, made her a natural performer. She had quite a following, especially among her own gender. We might regard her as the Taylor Swift or Lady Gaga <laughs> of the 1600s. One young woman, whose name is unknown, saw her perform and became quite taken with her. Julie claimed she was tired of men and returned the girl's affections. 
The girl's parents disapproved and sent her away to a convent, but unsurprisingly, Julie followed. It seems they were intoxicated by their love for each other against all odds. They became outrageous outlaws together, stole the body of a deceased nun, <coughs> put the corpse in the girl's bed as a stand-in, <laughs> then burned the convent to the ground. <laughs> When I decided to become a burlesque dancer, I named myself after a nun. Not just any nun, but a nun who'd been through something. Chicaba, Sister Teresa Juliana of Santo Domingo. Born free to royal lineage in Africa, abducted into slavery, and taken to Spain, she died in a convent for fallen women. Although venerated after 268 years, she still awaits sainthood. I held her name in my head over the years, thinking that one day, I'd name my daughter, or perhaps a cat, Chikaba. <laughs> and coming up with a burlesque name, I knew I wanted something with depth and lasting meaning as opposed to a cheeky name or one with blatant sexual overtones. Cherry chocolate was not going to do it. <laughs> I'm jump off there and say when I decided to name myself Chikaba, I started to do research, and a, and a biblical scholar named Sue Houchkin had just started piecing together the actual re-interpreting, um, translating from the Portuguese, her biography. And it was funny, because I'm like, hi, I'm Chicaba, I'm a stripper. <laughs> it wasn't till going, and in the first layer of this essay, which I did with my master's thesis, I didn't know at that point that she had been relegated to a convent of prostitutes, fallen women, and the poor. I just knew she was a nun. And I knew there was racism involved in her finding a nunnery to take her, but it wasn't until we did this work that I learned that she worked exactly with my type of people. Black, but beautiful. Born a queen, died a slave, but instead of a slave, a queen. And a queen because she ruled over herself. And because she ruled over herself, still a queen. She is the central naked woman in Luncheon on the Grass. She is the woman on the train with her daughter, the railway, 1873. The woman with a guitar on her back coming out of a doorway onto the street eating cherries. She is a matador with a purple head scarf, a pink cape, and a yellow scarf in her pocket, her body twisting in formal rhythm within this triad of blooming colors. Col I'm just going to interrupt. The editor is here, right? One of the editors? Somebody said I should take out that whole list that <laughs> I just read. <laughs> because lists are boring to read, but I didn't want to do it. I think it was was that you? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you feel about the list? I love the list. All like right, it. good. Okay. We had a little discussion about that, but I didn't want to cut it because it seemed to lay the ground of how many times Manet painted a, uh, Victorine. So, <laughs> so thanks for letting me do that. <laughs> I have no idea what choice I would make. But I do know something about being the violent, traumatized daughter of an autocrat. My father frying pierogies for me while wearing his dead Ukrainian-American mother's apron in her cabin in the mountains flew into a rage. Get me a spatula, he screamed, quickly, quickly, and I jumped. He must have jumped, too. He must have jumped hard racing across the hills of Korea's 38th parallel at 23-year-old kid from the Pocono Mountains, the son of an immigrant coal miner with a hereditary foul temper. He must have jumped hard when he dragged a fellow soldier from behind enemy lines and back to the foxhole. He must have jumped and then fallen really hard when the shrapnel exploded in his body. The shrapnel, that leaden braille of history, bloomed hard and blue beneath his skin, sometimes falling out in the shower. His was the trauma of an industry manned by Eastern Europeans that fueled the American war machine. His was the trauma of the first frigid fissure of the Cold War that followed the incandescence of World War II. It is a cleft into which collective memory fell hard, a rupture nearly forgotten until now, as the man who became president threatens the North Korean autocrat with fire and fury, and the North Korean autocrat threatens a second Korean war in response. I did not go to war. By I am my father's daughter, the hereditary foul temper blooming blue and hard under my skin while my father grabbed my arm hard in one hand and held me in place, a soft bullseye for his hard kick. Ever vigilant as a girl, I did not sleep a wink. 
My analyst, a man, says I should separate these things, history, politics, how I suffered as a child. I mustn't conflate the domestic tableau with a theater of war or what I will just keep on suffering. Mm -hmm. But what's a daughter to do? In 1937, Nina Ras Popovic was denounced as an enemy of the Republic. She was expelled from the Komsomol, the Young Communist League, and fired from her job at the Glider School where she worked as an instructor. Fifteen days later, she was reinstated. By 1941, she was a senior lieutenant in the 46th Tamman Guards Night Bomber Regiment. She had been granted the privilege to be shot from the sky, to crash land, wounded and bleeding, to wander behind enemy lines, to watch bodies pile up in a field hospital, and once recovered to be sent back to do it all over again. This is how it goes. They were daughters, just daughters, dangling without parachutes in the treacherous skies of the blackest mm. nights in history. Yeah. <laughs> Who was my mother before the trauma of losing her mother? Who was her family and how did they shape her? What were the forces of love and pain that she absorbed and passed on to me? My mother showed her care for me mostly through her strict rules governing my education and physical health. Though it was problematic for me, I find what I miss is her controlling nature. Her, <laughs> strong, <laughs> her strong grasp of facts and emotions that she wielded in any argument. On most days, when Nangeli steps out of her hut and walks down the dirt road, she is naked from the waist up. As a lower caste woman, she is forbidden to cover her breasts in public. Under the king's decree, only upper caste women have the right to hide their breasts from the eyes of strangers. Nangeli's breasts need to be uncovered because they display a coda that is easily interpreted. Clothing, hair, jewelry, they are all part of an elaborate signage system. The spectacle of the body that is replete with caste markers, as Professor Udya Kumar has pointed out. Members of the upper caste read Nangeli's naked breasts as we would a flashing stop sign, as a strict warning to maintain their distance from her to avoid being polluted. Eventually, Shanti came out holding a plate of food, rice and lentils and a vegetable all mushed together on an aluminum plate that was dented around the edges. She set the plate on the floor and laid out a mat next to it. Please sit, she said. And I, dumbstruck, obeyed. Her smile was off kilter and excited. We are Brahmin. I am not allowed to eat with you, she said. I'll eat inside, okay? Before I could open my mouth, she turned and disappeared behind the curtain. I hadn't thought of Shanti in years until I started writing this essay. Then I remembered the throat closing, helpless humiliation. The way I slumped, blindsided and abject on the floor, staring at that damaged plate of food. It all came back. My resentment, my swift, hard revulsion toward Shanti, my brain stuttering. How dare she? How dare she? She slips the linen coat over her arms and admires its flare over her hips. She laces her brown leather shoes. She takes a few steps, amazed at how much easier it is to walk without a petticoat. She grabs the worn straw hat off her bed and places it on cropped brown locks, adjusting it so a shadow falls over her face, partially obscuring her Roman nose and sharp jawline. She opens the door and steps out into the crisp night air, hoping it will ease the apprehension that has gnawed at her all morning. She juts out her chin with the confidence she's seen men wear throughout her young life, the type that says, I belong here, I have nothing to fear. Deborah Sampson was born on December 17, 1760, she's about to turn 258 years old, <laughs> in Plimpton, Massachusetts, not far from Boston. She was exactly the kind of woman I idolized as a child, someone who fought for what she believed in despite the social barriers placed upon her. She fit the dictionary definition of deliverance as someone who sought liberation in many different ways. Deborah Sampson didn't wait to be rescued. She brought about her own deliverance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.